clap your hands like this. Whoa, whoa, just like that, Wisdom. I hear you. Come on, sing whoa, whoa. Everybody right here, repeat after me. Let's do it. Say whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on, right where you are. Lift up the name of Jesus. Whoa. We will praise the name of Jesus. We will praise the name of Jesus. We will praise the name of that great name. That great name. Let's lift up the Lord. You alone are exalted. Your name be lifted above all the earth. your name above all other thrones. Shine your light, shine through us. Say we, we will praise the name of Jesus. We will praise the name no matter what of we're Jesus. Going. We will praise the name Say that great name.
turn with me into your Bible to the book of Acts, the second chapter. We're going to go from verse 40 down to verse 47. The book of Acts, the second chapter, verse 40 through 47. And it reads, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, in prayer. Then fear came among every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among anyone had need. Now continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from the house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I just want to speak with you just for a little while this morning on the subject of getting back to God's business. Getting back to God's business. Every week we are blessed to receive a fresh word that has been prepared in season and out of season to correct, to rebuke, encourage us with great patience and careful instructions. Oftentimes, should I say more times than not, we only want to hear the word that comes to encourage us not the word that comes to correct or rebuke us. We find ourselves wanting to just take the word that is given to us and we find ourselves wanting to just scream and shout and holler and throw up our hands and do all of that. But sometimes there has to be a word that comes to make us search ourselves, search our hearts, make us make a closer look at our walk and where we measure up in the eyes of God, where we measure up in his expectations of us. We want to ask God to do all of these things and to give us all of these blessings and that's the type of word that we want each and every day uh, or each and every time that we enter into the sanctuary. But then there's times where we have to sit and wonder, okay God, what are you really speaking to me? What are you really saying to me? When we, when we enter into the house of God and we, we get a word, sometimes that word comes to convict us, to correct us, to make us better. And that's what God is saying today. We were taught that the cost of becoming familiar with God can hinder his power in our lives and that it can stun our growth. We can, we can start to take God for granted and take advantage of his grace and his mercy that he extends to us. We were told that we must have a mind of a champion, that we must release old mindsets and that we must focus on the things of God. We must do an exchange and line our thinking up with the word. So we've been told this already. Doing this would not only impact our lives, but impact the lives of others. We were given the traits of a kingdom servant, saying that we must be humble and holy and happy, not to have selfish ambitions. As believers, we come to church to learn how to follow God, to be strengthened spiritually, and to live a life according to the scriptures. The church is made up of God's people. It is to teach us biblical doctrine so that we can be rooted and grounded in our faith. Coming to church every Sunday to receive a word to get us what we need is great. Getting a breakthrough when we've been dealing with something for so long is awesome. Receiving revelation and directing direction on, or, or guidance on a, about a situation that we've been dealing with for a lifetime is amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's life-changing. 
Each Sunday, we receive a visitation from the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Each Sunday, we are blessed with his presence. He delivers, he sets free, he releases blessings, he answers prayer. Why? Because he's God. He's just that kind of God. And he loves us, and he is faithful to us. He wants to dwell with us, and he shows up every single time. We serve an awesome God. We come to church with the expectation of receiving everything that we need from God. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because we should come to church expecting a mighty move of God. In fact, God wants to bless the socks off of you. He wants to blow your mind. He wants to do everything for you that you are asking of him. He wants to give you your heart's desires. But let me say this. In the words of the Miss Janet Jackson, he does all of these things for us. But what have you done for him lately? What are you offering him? What are you sacrificing? How are you honoring him? Matthew 15 and 8 reads this way. It says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, we sing this song that is not about us, that it's about Jesus. But I think that sometimes we change the lyrics of that song. And we say, it's all about us. It's all about me. And sometimes I think with doing that, we misunderstand what that song is saying. Because we have to keep it in mind that it is all about Jesus. It is all about him. And we have to act accordingly. So why do I say that we change the lyrics? Why do I say that it's all about us? Have you looked around the sanctuaries lately? Not just in here, not just in Word and Season Ministry, but the church, universal. Listen to this. I came across this interesting study. It says, studies show that the decline in church membership is mainly due to the increasing number of people who express no religious preference. No religious preference. It goes on to say that the number has increased from 8% to 13%. Now that's partly due to COVID, but mainly due to the believers failing to share Jesus with non-believers. And here's something else interesting that I found in my study. That not regularly attending church not only has a potential to negatively, negatively affect public health, but also family stability and population growth. Who would have ever thought? This is a sad truth. Believers are not attending church themselves on a regular basis. They're saying things like, well, COVID showed me that I don't have to go to church every Sunday. COVID showed me that I can watch uh, church right in my house, that I can watch it right here on YouTube like we're doing today as we're streaming. But I want to just say this. It is not the same. It is not the same when you're not in the house of God. Because there's things that happens in the house of God that you can very well miss out on. And you can miss out on the mighty move of God and the things that he want to say to you in that moment. There could be a time that he could be speaking to you in that moment in the sanctuary among like-minded people. Like-minded saints of God. It's nothing for believers, leaders, to miss church. It's, it's not even given a second thought. Everything else comes first. Everything that I want to do takes precedence over God. Everything that I want to do takes precedence over anything that God wants to do. No matter what it is, it can be ball games, it can be work, it can be uh, yard work, it can be shopping, any of that thing, any of those things can take place over God or just simply not feeling like going to church so if we don't feel like going to church we don't go we know it's true and lots of times if it's addressed across the pulpit now we're mad <laughs> we get mad now we really want to leave the church because we want that sermon that makes us shout makes us want to throw our hands up makes us want to holler we don't want the sermon that comes to help us, to make us better, 
to make us stronger. And that's what I aim to do today. I just want to give a word that's going to set us free. Because in John 8 and 32, it says that ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Family, co-workers, neighbors, friends, they're all dying and going to hell every day because we fail to do the things that God has commanded us to do. And that is to be witnesses of him. But how are we going to be witnesses of, of him if we're showing up at the same time in the same places that non-believers are showing up to? If we're acting like non-believers when we're complaining, if we're acting like non-believers when we're acting a fool, when we're acting like non-believers when we um, are, are, are have a disagreement and now we're out here fighting and, and, and on Facebook Live, uh, talking nonsense and doing the things that we know that we shouldn't be doing. How and where is the distinction? How are people going to know that it's us? No one is saying that you cannot miss church. That's not what we're saying at all. I mean, it's understood that things do come up. In fact, sometimes it's necessary to miss. But when there's no balance, when you make it a habit of missing church, just because you don't feel like coming to church and it's not convenient for you, then maybe that's a time that we need to check our heart. That might be a heart issue. We need to search our, 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 ourselves in that. You know, we want all the blessings of God. And oh my gosh, let me tell you something. The people at Word and Season Ministries, God has definitely blessed us. I mean, he just keep on blessing, blessing upon blessing upon blessings. We are without a doubt a blessed church. Yes, we are. We have this beautiful sanctuary. We have all the equipment. We have everything we need to uh, operate uh, the way effectively. Uh, we're able to come to you today streaming live, uh, that we are able to uh, be able to do all of these things. We're blessed. God has blessed us with so many different things. He's blessed us with new jobs, new houses, new businesses, new husbands, new wives, new money, good health. We are so blessed. We are blessed with so much more. And at least that we can do, I mean the least we can do, is to do our part in how we are to help in winning souls. We take his grace for granted. We become too familiar with his goodness and his kindness towards us. We say things like, oh, God knows my heart. He knows how I feel about him. He don't mind. He's okay. He knows what's going on in my life. But I got to tell you, I'm so glad that God don't treat us like that. I'm so glad that God do not measure our actions to how he want to bless us. I am so glad that he doesn't measure how and what we do according to uh, what he has told us that he was going to do for us when we don't show up, when we're not doing our part. He deserves so much better. He deserves so much more. Uh, UPS has a slogan. And that slogan is, what is brown? What can brown do for you? But that's how we treat God. We treat God like, okay, what can God do for me? When we should be asking, what can I do for God? What are we doing? When did it get like this? We do have a responsibility. We do have a responsibility. Luke 12 and 48 says this. It says, that to everyone that has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. We as believers have a purpose. We have a responsibility. We have a duty to carry out the assignments that is on our lives. We are uh, talking uh, about the church now. I'm talking to believers. This is who this message is for today. God is calling us to a higher calling. He is calling us to something so much greater than ourselves. He is calling us back to the church, back to what the church was intend, uh, originally intended. And let's say this, let me say this. Jesus, our best example, when he was uh, 12 years old 
and his parents was looking for him in Jerusalem. They had lost him. They were frantic. They did not know where he was. They searched high and low. They searched everywhere. Everywhere that a 12-year-old would be. Or they thought that a 12-year-old would be. But then Jesus said to when they found him, he said, why do you seek me? This is Luke 2 and 49. He said, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? We as believers like Jesus must be about our father's business. What does this look like? What does it look like with getting back to God's business? So let me answer that question for you. The text gives us several, several examples of what this looks like. It talks about a group of men who, uh, who, who understood. They understood the assignment. They understood what Jesus told them to do when he ascended to heaven. He told them that we are to be witnesses of him. And so they took that assignment seriously and they changed the world. They changed the world. In fact, they turned the world upside down. So there's a lot going on in this text that's going to help us get back to God's business. And I just want to share four with you today, if you don't mind. I just want to share four. And the first one that I want to share with you today is we must pray. We must pray. Somebody say, we must pray. Second Chronicle says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will hear, heal their land. Second Chronicles. That, what, what I'm hearing in that, in, that, in that verse, in that scripture is that God requires some things of us. And in order for him to do what he wants to do to us, for us, and through us, there are some things that we have to do first. So the book of Acts, written by Luke, uh, he's a, Luke was a historian and he was a theologian who bridges the Gospels with the New Testament letters. He tells us about the history of the early church. Being a historian means that Luke had to take a deep dive and he had to gather facts of eyewitness accounts of the apostles and what they did in the early days. Luke shows us in the early days at the early church that the church was founded on prayer. The church was founded on prayer. This church, Word and Season Ministries, was founded on prayer. And I'm going to pause for a quick moment here to tell you that corporate prayer is offered every Wednesday at 6 a.m. on the prayer line. And it's offered the first Saturday of every month at 9 a.m. right here in the sanctuary. All are welcome to come and participate. All are encouraged to come and participate. Amen? Amen. And as I was saying, the text shows us that after the people received the word from Peter, that they, when they accepted Jesus, the thing that they, they, the first thing that they said or that they did was they prayed. Verse 42 right here said that they continued steadfastly in prayer. Prayer is a, a, a needed necessity. It unleashes God's power and strength. It gives him the opportunity to prove himself to us. It allows us to communicate with him and learn more about his plan for our lives. The Bible says in Luke 18 and 1, it says that men ought to always pray and faint not or don't give up. So we should always be praying. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 through 18 say, pray without ceasing and give in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God wants us to pray. He loves communing with us. Isn't it ironic that the very thing that gets us close to God is the very thing that we find so difficult to do? You'll find throughout the Bible that everything that Jesus uh, was doing constantly 
that as he was going about, as he was uh, uh, healing, as he was preaching, as he was teaching, he always took time out to pray. You will find him praying everywhere, every day, every uh, morning, noon, night, when he had to make a decision, when, 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 when he needed strength, uh, when, when, when he was angry, uh, 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 his last hours, he prayed. He prayed because he understood the power of prayer. There is power in prayer. He taught the disciples how to pray. And they carried that same trait into establishing the early church. Jesus said this in Matthew 6 and 6. He said, when you pray, he said, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what you what you have done in secret will reward you. Jesus said that is how we ought to pray. Prayer will change the uh, trajectory of your life. It will change the trajectory of the church. One writer says this. He said that prayer energizes the heart of a believer through the power of the spirit. Prayer is a must. It is essential to the growth of the believer and the growth of the church. It links us with God. We become more confident in ourselves, in our ability when we pray. Prayer brings us peace. It builds relationships and it helps us to experience God in ways that we have never experienced him before. Prayer allows God to move on any situation. We need prayer to strengthen us, to guide us, to help get us the answers that we need when we so desperately need them. Somebody needs to, we must pray. We must pray. So, 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 so there's something else that we need to be doing according to the text. The text says, and this is my second one, it says, we must fellowship. We must fellowship. Hebrews 10 and 25 says this. It says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much to the, to the more as you see the day approaching. The text shows that the disciples knew the importance to fellowship to maintain growth. They were in consistent or constant fellowship. The first time we see it is in verse 42. So ask yourself, why should I come to church? Why should I assemble? Many believers uh, believe that, uh, especially since COVID, believes that it's not uh, necessary to come to a building. They, they, they say, we're the church, and, and the church is in me. So they don't feel like it's necessary uh, to come to a building to receive the word. They feel like they can do church sitting at the house and practice their faith in other ways. If they can watch it on TV, uh, they can stream online, they can do whatever, anything besides come to a church building. One of the biggest problems churches are facing today is poor discipleship models. Poor discipleship models. 31% do not step, this is 31% of Americans, and this is just Americans, 31% of Americans do not step foot inside of a church building. And sadly, this number does include believers. People who have taken him and, and proclaimed him as Lord and Savior. But watch this. We are called to be empowered by God and to do life together we must come to church we must fellowship for spiritual maturity coming to church gives us the opportunity to serve and to worship god oh there's that s word serve yes serve we must come to church to serve we must come to church to worship our faith grows when we fellowship. In the text, the early church established firsthand the importance of fellowship. 
You see it in verse 42, you see it again in verse 44, and you see it again in verse 46. One writer said this, he wrote, our faith is not only an assembling faith, that it is a tangible faith that compels us to see, to hear, to touch, to taste, to smell, and to feel. In other words, fellowshipping awakens all of our senses. God compels us to draw near, not only to him, but to one another. Coming to church is essential means of grace, whereby believers worship and are equipped to live as God witness people in the world. The text help us to see that when we fellowship, everyone uh, has their needs met and God's agenda is, uh, is the, the agenda at hand. Not our agenda, but it's God's agenda that is at hand. Everyone gives and everyone receives. We begin uh, to understand the pastor's heart when we come to church and when we fellowship. We, 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 we get a clearer understanding of his vision. Uh, knees are met, hearts are turned around, people are saved, people are set free, people are delivered. All of these things happen when we come to church and fellowship together. Fellowshipping is a must to help us grow spiritually. We're not preaching this just to have some seats filled in the sanctuary or just to see bodies in a chair. We're, we're, we're preaching this to fill you up with knowledge and understanding so that lives can be changed. See, see, you receive healing and deliverance when you become better witnesses. You receive healing and you receive deliverance when you become better witnesses. Remember, I'm talking to believers. I'm talking to the church. You'll be filled to overflow uh, when you empty yourselves, when you go out into the highways and the byways and you compel them to come into the house of God so that the kingdom of God so that the kingdom of God can be increased with miracles, signs, wonders that can take place and people can be amazed at the works of God. All because you came to church. We must equip ourselves for the battle that is before us. We must stay vigilant. We must do our part to allow God to move on everybody's situation, to impact everybody's life. We must go get, get back to God's business to show the world that we are part of a kingdom that would no longer compromise God for everything else. There is still an enemy out there who seeks to destroy, who, who, who seeks to kill, who, who, who seeks to uh, kill or to steal uh, God's church. But we already know that because of this church built on the foundation that it was built on, that God's church will stand that the gates of hell shall not prevail but we must do our part God's church will stand and the enemy is already defeated through the word of God so I don't know about you I don't know about you but when, when I come into the sanctuary when I when I come into the house of God when, when I see like-minded uh, uh, believers uh, blessing God and, and praising God and, 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 and worshiping God it, it makes me feel good my, my, my heart begins to sing and, and I'm just so excited to be among people who believe like I believe and I want to share that with my friends I want to share that with my co-workers you know, I want to share that with people that I meet I want my my life to be an example because I want to come to church and I want to get filled with the Holy Spirit and I want to get more and more of God's Word because I know that the more word that I receive the more word that I can give and I just want you to know that when you do these types of things then God can move on the lives of his people when you do these types of things then God can his hand can be on his people and he can do so many wonderful things he is the same God that he was back then and miracles signs and wonder are still possible today but all we have to do is our part we have to do our part we have to come to church we have to fellowship we have to pray hallelujah 
Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody say we must fellowship. We must fellowship. The next one is this. Here's the next one. We must worship. We must worship. Our primary purpose for living is to worship God. And I want to say that one more time. Our primary purpose for living is to worship God. I read something that I thought was very interesting, and, and, and it, read, it, it read like this. It says, every product exists for a purpose determined by the manufacturer, not the product. Wow. Every product exists for a purpose determined by the manufacturer and not the product. We are the product. It has been determined by the one who created us that we must worship in order for God to do what he needs to do. So God can get the glory out of our lives. We all have an assignment. Assignment is not just given to the pastors or to the deacons and to the elders and to the ministers. Assignments are given to everyone. We were created to worship God for who he is, not just for what he's done. We must worship. John 4 and 24 reads like this. It says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we do this? We do this by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's how we do this. That's how we do this. That's how we worship. That's what worship is. It's presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Our holy bodies. Holy bodies. You know, Pastor talked about holiness last week, and he said holiness is still right. So listen to uh, Romans 12 and 1, and it reads, I beseech you, therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So what does this mean? This means that Paul is begging us. Paul is, 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 is he is like, please do this. He is begging us. He is pleading with us and saying that, uh, we need to worship God with all of our beings. Not just when it's convenient, but when it's not convenient. Not just when you feel like it, but when you don't feel like it. See, we need to serve when we uh, don't feel like it, not just when we feel like it. Because if we do it like that, then lots of times nothing will get done. We have to do these things so that God can move in our lives. God, uh, so showing up, showing up when nobody shows up, that's serving. Giving when nobody else is giving, that's serving. Volunteering when no one else volunteers, that's, that's serving. That's what we are to do. I mean, we, this is reasonable. It's reasonable. This is our reasonable service to him. We must give our whole selves. We must give our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our tongue, our hands, our feet. We must give every part of us. We were created by the creator to worship him with every part of our being so that we can be used by him for his glory. So how are they worshiping in the text? How are they worshiping in the text? So here's how they're worshiping in the text. They're preaching the gospel. They are being witnesses. They're praying. They're fellowshipping. They're giving. They're serving. They're in the church. They're at the temple. Oh, people are being saved and the church is growing. That's, that's how they are worshiping him. Real worship is not just singing songs and closing your eyes and lifting your hands. But real worship is understanding the Godhead and doing the will of God, which encompasses doing for others. 
That's real worship. Hebrews 13, 15, the verse 15 and 16 de defines worship as this. They said, by him, therefore, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. This is the, this is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. How many of you want to please God today? How many of you want to worship him in ways that you have uh, never worshiped him before? I know I do. I know I do. And here's the final one. Here's the final one. We must mature. We must grow. We must mature. We have to grow. We have to grow. Somebody said we have to grow. We have to mature. We, we can't walk around as infants our whole life. We have to grow up. And the thing is that we have to be eating the right food. We have to be eating the right things to help us to grow up. In order for us to have an impact on the world, we must grow. Listen to uh, the letter that Paul wrote right here. He wrote in uh, Ephesians 4 and 1. He says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Ephesians 4, 12 and 13 says this. It says, the responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build the church the body of Christ, a complete standard of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. I believe God is looking for a church. I believe God is looking for a church that will carry out the assignment that has been placed on our lives. I believe that he's looking for a church that won't compromise any longer. That will say, God, wherever you send me, I will go. I believe that God is looking for a church who will say, God, whatever it is that you will have me to do, I will do it. God, we're no longer going to compromise you, God, for worldly pleasures. I believe that he, 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 he is sending us out to do uh, the things that he has required of us. And I believe that we are a church who can do that. I believe that the church universal can get back to God's business, can get back to the things that, that, that they were doing in the early church, that when the church started out, and the, and, and the people in the church was growing and, and their lives were being changed and, and people were being saved. I believe that we can get back to that. I believe that miracles, signs and wonders can continue to happen because we do those things, because we pray, because we have fellowship, because we are maturing and because we understand what re real worship is. I believe that we are a people who's been called by God to do a work in the high, at the highways and the byways and in the marketplace and, and, and on our jobs and, and, and all around this world and this country. And, and I believe that we are equipped, that God has equipped us to do the things that he has called us to do, that we would no longer compromise what we want to do. So it's not my will, God, that he's looking for people that will say, not my will, but thy will be done. So so I believe that God is calling us to a different place, that he is elevating us to a place where he can do some work. God wants to show us his hands. I just believe that he wants to do a real work through us. And in order for him to do that real work through us, we have to show up. We have to let God do the things. We need to be avail ourselves to, to, to be used of God. So I just believe that he is calling upon a people who will be that people for him who would allow him to, to use them and not compromise what they want to do and do what God wants them to do. I believe that we can do this, that we can get back 
to what the early church has said. I just believe that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen to this final piece here. It says, Jesus asked Peter. He asked Peter three times. He asked Peter, do you love me? He asked him that three times. And three times, Peter answered yes. And what I want to make sure I point out here, that was a threefold question. It was threefold. And he, so he told Peter, he said, if you love me, he said, you will tend, you will care, and you will provide for my sheep. And I just believe that God is calling us to do just that in this day. For such a time as this, I believe God is calling us to tend, to care, and to provide for his people. And we have to get back to business. We have to get back to business to let God use us to do just that. We have to get back to God's business, not our business, not our own agenda, but God's agenda. We have to no longer compromise what God is doing in our lives, that we're soaking up all the blessings, that we're reaping all the harvest, and nobody else is. So we have to learn how to share this thing, to share the gospel with the people who need it the most. But we have to be the ones who set the example. We have to be the one to show up. We have to be the one who understand what real worship is. We have to be the ones who is praying, who is praying for God to move on, the, on, your, on his people. We are living in the last days, whether you want to believe that or not. We are living in the last days. And I believe God is saying, get right, church, and let's go home. I believe God is saying, it's time for us to wake up and do what I have called you to do. And he has sent the word to let us know that this is what his expectation of us is. So we have to understand that when God is telling us to do this thing, that we have to adhere to what God is doing and what he is saying. We have to avail ourselves to be used by God. Get back to God's business. We gotta pray. We gotta worship. We got a fellowship and we have to mature. We have to lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily beset us. We have to get rid of the attitudes. We have to get rid of the attitudes. And we have to say, God, it's not about us, but it's all about you. And God, we just thank you for being patient with us and giving us another chance to get it right. So I bless you, God. I bless God in this place. I bless God for who he is and what he's doing in the lives of his people. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I give your name glory, honor, and praise. I magnify your name, oh God. God, I lift you on high. You are truly an awesome God. There is none like you, God, in all the earth. And God, I just thank you right now that you sent a word, God, to tell us what you have need of, oh God. You have need of us to, be, to pray more, to fellowship more, to worship more, and to mature. So God, I just thank you right now that your people have heard your word, that they would not just be hearers of your word, oh God, but they will be doers of your word. I pray that this word will not return unto you void, God. That it will accomplish everything, oh God, that you have sent it out to do. And I pray right now, God, that your people will receive this word. Receive what you have for them, oh God. Receive the word that you have spoken on today, oh God. I just thank you, oh God, for all that you're doing in our lives and how you are changing us. God, help us to be better witnesses of you. Help us to uh, listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us when we are talking to people, oh God. Help us to follow what the Spirit is speaking, God. Help us to avail ourselves to be used by you, oh God. Help us to become better believers, God, better Christians, God. Help us to walk worthy of that call, God, that you have on our lives. God, I just thank you, and I do give you glory, honor, and praise. I magnify you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. 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 I pray.
pray that tonight's virtual Bible study blessed you as much as it blessed me. I'm so grateful for the wonderful word we receive here at Word and Season Ministries every week. If you would like to partner with us tonight, if the word blessed you and you want to partner with us tonight in your giving, you can do so uh, as they have put the information on the screen uh, and our various ways of giving. Uh, we're so grateful that you spent some time with us tonight and that you are finding it in your hearts to sow into this ministry. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday and pray God's blessings over your family. Join us on Sunday at 9 a.m. in person or you can follow us on our multiple social media platforms and our website. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. All of those places you can find wonderful things about Word and Season. I pray God continues to bless you and your family in a tremendous way. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Remember, for every season, there is a word in season. And don't forget, C3 Living, caring, community, connection. God bless.